dangerous and they unfortunately will sometimes uh, harm patients. So uh, a lot of these are, are nondescript. Uh, you may not recognize them. And this is kind of a maxim that uh, we'll talk about just briefly at the very end of the talk. Uh, whenever dermatology and soft tissue neoplasia kind of intersects, usually the outcome is bad. So if you get a soft tissue neoplasm as a dermatologist, treat that with a very high degree of respect. Um, get it out of your practice. Get it in the hands of surgical oncology because these things are, are tough. Uh, the most important one probably that we see that's fairly common is, is Merkel cell, uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma, primary Merkel cell or metastatic small cell carcinoma. What is the neuroendocrine system? Well, it's kind of the combination of the endocrine and the nervous system together. Uh, this is a tumor that, that hits these cells, uh, carcinoids, glucagonomas, and then the non-functioning uh, cells like Merkel cells. These are tactile sensory cells. They're, they're similar to what the cats have in their whiskers, uh, so they're actually uh, used for detecting things. This is a little picture diagram of a Merkel cell here. You see the nerve coming in, and it uh, intercalates with the cell here, which then has these little uh, intercalations with keratinocytes. So you rub your skin, you feel it, the light touch, Merkel cells detect that. If you look at these uh, clinically, they usually are skin color to reddish lesions on the scalp, uh, sun exposed areas quite commonly. Uh, here's one example of you see it here. These are often clinically thought to be lymphomas or something like that. They're usually not clinically thought uh, to be diagnosed uh, as Merkel cell by, by clinicians. If you look at them under the microscope, you see these, uh, this infuse uh, neoplasm with these small blue staining cells. Uh, the immunoperoxidase staining, as Ella talked about before, this beautiful example is paranuclear dot staining with cytokeratin 20 with these other stains that, that uh, you see as well that I'll show you some examples of in a minute. So this guy comes in your practice, you think it looks like a lymphoma, you take a biopsy of it, uh, and it shows the, there's several variants of Merkel cell. Uh, we're going to first show the small cell variant, and you can see this is comprised of the sheets of these very small, poorly differentiated cells that have this indistinct chromatin. Uh, these lesions, again, have a very bad prognosis. This is synaptophysin highlighting the cells, and this is the cytokeratin, pan-cytokeratin, this is these nice paranuclear dot pattern, uh, which is uh, very characteristic of that. Another histologic pattern is the intermediate size cell Merkel cell. So again, this is a Merkel cell also, but notice that these cells now are a little bit larger than those seen in the small cell variant. And then you see a, a trabecular pattern sometimes where you get these cells arranged in these little strands that are intersected by these uh, zones of collagen here. So again, this is another histologic pattern of Merkel cell that you'll see. Okay, and then here's the cytokeratin 20, the nice paranuclear dot staining pattern. And uh, this guy also had Merkel cell here in his skin and uh, another area where it had been biopsied. And this is a diffuse trabecular pattern with small cells. It's almost, this is the one to me that looks most like a lymphoma. When you see this pattern, again, these are very, very small cells arranged between and among collagen bundles. And it's, even in high magnification, these can look a lot like lymphocytes. So again, when you're sitting with this uh, pattern, think about this, do the aminoproxase stains, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll get an appropriate diagnosis of this lesion. Sometimes we actually get squamous differentiation with Merkel cell and Merkel cell is one of the lesions that can give you pagetoid epidermal involvement sometimes. So look at this. You've got these nests of cells, cells that are arranged singly within the epidermis. Looks kind of like a melanoma here, but then you've got the Merkel cell down here, and then you've got the squamous differentiation here. So this is, we often sometimes will even see Bowen's disease overlying the Merkel cell carcinoma. Uh, so here you get Merkel cell carcinoma in situ, so this looks just like a melanoma, and you need to stain this to make sure that you're not missing uh, Merkel cell carcinoma in some cases. This was an interesting case that a few years ago of a guy that had this uh, kind of micro Merkel cell carcinoma. He had a history of basal cell in his head and neck area, and it excised. And uh, then two weeks, he developed this little uh, area in his uh, uh, parotid gland and was found to have uh, with fine needle aspiration Merkel cell that had metastasized. They looked him over very carefully. They took a biopsy of this little area right here, and lo and behold, this thing was a Merkel cell carcinoma, a little teensy tiny Merkel cell. Even though it was small, it actually metastasized this guy's parotid. So Merkel can be very aggressive. It doesn't have to be large. It doesn't have to be diffuse. It can sometimes be a small lesion and can still have an aggressive biologic behavior. So this is a dangerous tumor that you need to recognize. Um, Treatment of Merkel cell, uh, good data to show that central lymph node biopsy is helpful in Merkel cell, decreases uh, uh, relapse-free survival is better in patients that have no central lymph node involvement. It's probably, again, like melanoma, kind of a staging procedure, but it is something that if you get a diagnosis of Merkel cell, you should probably refer them for uh, 
sentinel lobe biopsy. These are some of the things in the differential diagnosis. Probably the one of most importance is metastatic small cell carcinoma. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then the, we, know the, we know the etiology of Merkel cell interesting left. This was actually reported a few years ago. Chang and Moore, they were the first people that discovered HHV8 in Kaposi sarcoma. Uh, they actually found the Merkel cell contains polyoma virus, and they used this interesting technique known as a complete genome uh, transcriptome subtraction, where they kind of subtracted out all the normal stuff and looked at what was left there, and they actually found that uh, this polyoma virus is present. Now, these are uh, double-strand DNA viruses that cause slow viral diseases, nephropathy, nephropathy and multifocal leukoencephalopathy, so they're not good viruses to have, but they actually can lead to uh, Merkel cell, and here you see the polyoma viruses uh, in this uh, photograph here. Now, the differential diagnosis of Merkel is, is another uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma, metastatic small cell carcinoma. And it's important to distinguish these two because uh, basically a Merkel cell you can at least treat locally. They still may get a bad prognosis. But if it's a metastatic lesion, then it's obviously you've already got a bad prognosis. It's spread from an internal site to the skin. And one of the things that helps us is if the TTF1 uh, is positive, thyroid transcription factor 1. This guy had a metastatic small cell carcinoma. He had known uh, oat cell carcinoma of the lung, and so it really wasn't a diagnostic problem in this case, but basically you can see that histologically it looks pretty similar to Merkel cell. Uh, again, this looks like that trabecular pattern I showed you before. So when you get back that diagnosis, or you make the diagnosis of this trabecular pattern, especially on histology, you should do uh, staining not only for cytokeratin 20 and the neuroendocrine markers, but also do a TTF1 and this one was strongly positive. If it's positive like this, that's, that's good evidence that you're dealing with a metastatic small cell rather than a primary Merkel cell. So that's helpful in that situation. Now, dermatic fibrosarcoma two brands, you all know about this tumor. Uh, there's some interesting things about it, but I want to just point out a couple of things about it that are important. Again, these are some clinical photos of it. Uh, they don't always look like multiple mod, uh, multinodular tumors like this. Sometimes they can be almost kind of nondescript plaques. They can be atrophic areas. And this is the classic pattern. We get the diffuse involvement with the storiform pattern and the honeycomb diffuse involvement of the subcutaneous fat. This is very, very characteristic of DFSP, the storiform pattern and then the honeycomb involvement. And if you stain these, um, you'll get strong positive staining with CD34, negative staining with factor 13A. This, again, the honeycomb pattern, if you see this, think of DFSP. Uh, again, there's a childhood variant, giant cell fibroblastoma, which is a variant of DFSP, uh, generally tends to behave in a similar fashion, should be excised and treated appropriately. There's also a, a plaque type CD34 positive medallion dermal dendrocytic tumor that can sometimes look like a DFSP, but generally it doesn't does not give you this honeycomb pattern. There's really virtually nothing else uh, in dermatopathology that gives you that kind of pattern. Now, this was an interesting case of a true story. A lady came in. Uh, she had this long-standing lesion on her skin. It, it looks kind of pale, not just because the slide is taken uh, at, at uh, overexposed. It's because it was a very pale lesion. It had these very mixoid areas in it, the spindle cell uh, proliferation here. And you can see there's these spindle cells in the background with this mixoid morphology and a couple of mast cells in here as well. Uh, the lesion Came, it stayed there. It was pre a re biopsy submitted as a recurrent neurofibroma. Here you see the shave biopsy this again. And now it's got the same mixoid morphology at the top. But down here you've now got what looks like a storiform pattern with more uh, uh, spindle cell morphology. And what this was was a DFSP that had a mixoid morphology to it. And if you take a shave biopsy of a DFSP, sometimes you're going to get that mixoid component. It doesn't look like a DFSP. It'll be misdiagnosed by, as a cutaneous myxoma or something like that. And so you want to make sure that you take a good deep incisional biopsy to make sure that you hit some of the more diagnostic areas. If you only get the myxoid area, you can miss the diagnosis. And you don't want to leave one of these things alone. They do eventually get into vital structures like the brachial plexus and other things like that. It can become unresectable. So you want to make sure that you don't get a sampling error uh, when you're dealing with the FSP. Now, MOS is a great surgical option for this. And what's interesting now is that there is a new drug that you can use to target the FSB Gleevec. Uh, and actually, uh, we do know that there's cytogenetic abnormalities. They have uh, material from chromatome 17 and 22, and sometimes they'll have a 17, 22 ring uh, chromosome. And basically what these do is fuse this collagen 1A1 gene onto the uh, platelet-derived growth factor beta gene and results in this overexpression of, of uh, these proliferating fibroblastic cells. So here you see a, a, a translocation on a chromosome. And the good thing about this is that Gleevec actually will target this. And so what you can do is before you do Mohs, 
treat it with Gleevec, shrink it down, and then your Mohs margins will be less. So this is something to remember. It doesn't treat the DFSP alone. You still have to cut it out. But if you make the diagnosis of DFSP, suggest to your clinician if you're dermatophologist or if you get the diagnosis back, think about using Gleevec before you do the surgery. This is in your handout. I'm not going to read it, but it just shows you all the different cytogenetic abnormalities that are available out there with these tumors. And a lot of these now actually have drugs that are directed to these. Now, the other bad actor that you get into sometimes is angiosarcoma. And again, the key thing is to make sure you get the diagnosis. There are several variants that you're aware of. Probably the one that we see the most commonly is the so-called Wilson-Jones, which is the head and neck of the elderly person. These people come in with what looks like a bruise, uh, this pink area like this. Uh, this is a terrible situation, very difficult to treat, very difficult to, uh, and almost always fatal in, in when you get into this situation. And there's several different histologic patterns that I'll show you. Uh, probably the most important one is when you get these diffuse, well-differentiated areas that look like uh, benign uh, vascular uh, hemangiomas. So these are the, the, the four main types, well-differentiated, moderately differentiated, poorly differentiated, and epithelioid. The well-differentiated type, again, this is not a very good biopsy for angiosarcoma. Thank goodness they got the diagnosis, but you can see there are these staghorn type irregular blood vessels present diffusely throughout this entire area here. It's on sun-damaged skin of the scalp. Very difficult to diagnose this if you just had this as a, as a sole thing. If you didn't have any clinical correlation, you probably would just call it a, a benign vascular proliferation. But this is all well-differentiated angiosarcoma, so it's very nefarious, a very dangerous uh, thing when you just get something like that. Later on, you can make the diagnosis more carefully. This is the kind of biopsy we like to get. Unfortunately, the other biopsies are done when the clinician doesn't think about angiosarcoma, so you have to have a high index of suspicion. Here we now have the uh, regular jagged spaces with the uh, atypical endothelial cells falling freely into the lumen, and these are very atypical, so in this case, you really wouldn't have much of a difficult time making the diagnosis if you have this kind of a biopsy. Uh, you could do immunoproxidase stains to prove that this is vascular, but it's pretty straightforward when you get that, this kind of change here with all these uh, irregular vascular spaces with the uh, cells falling freely into the lumen. And then sometimes it can be very poorly differentiated, look more like a spindle cell neoplasm. Uh, again, something like this you probably would have to stain. This is a CD31 stain highlighting this uh, quite nicely. And then there's this interesting variant that you may not be aware of known as an epithelioid angiosarcoma. Epithelioid because it looks like an epithelium. And sometimes I've seen these misdiagnosed as AFX and a squamous cell carcinoma. And again, these you, you probably, you're going to need immunoproxidase stains again to prove that this is vascular in nature. Um, this is just a very diffuse, poorly differentiated epithelioid neoplasm. Again, this could be a squamous cell carcinoma here. So occasionally, maybe a suggestion of some of these being slit-like spaces here, but again, this is mostly very, very epithelioid with these cells that are closely opposed to one another. I don't think I would call this just on the basis of this. The CD31 stain was diffuse and strongly positive, confirming the diagnosis, but you need to remember that lesion as well, and clinically, they can all look the same, so clinically, uh, it, it can look like a solid lesion, or it can look like basically just uh, any like other type of angiosarcoma. Sometimes we get angiosarcomas in younger people. They're usually seen in older individuals. This guy presented with this very subtle uh, erythematous area. had been there for a relatively short period of time. Uh, he noted it was getting worse with heat. And uh, when he actually put his head down in a Trudellenberg position, it actually got a lot darker. So we actually wrote this up in the archives of dermatology a few years ago. So it's a good clinical pearl, but you can see that there actually, this thing was a lot more extensive uh, than originally. Um, it's got a, we have sort of have some follow-up on him. This is a, one of his biopsies done. It's kind of a mapping biopsy, kind of determined the margin of his tumor. Again, very well differentiated variant of angiosarcoma. You can make the diagnosis here with these irregular uh, channels up here, present diffusely dissecting through the dermis. And then you see you got radiation therapy, actually got some improvement, but unfortunately uh, the thing started coming back. And uh, you can see now here it's beginning to recur, ulcerated, and uh, ultimately he ended up dying from this. And the lesion actually became far more poorly differentiated as time went on. Um, this was his lesion taken from the scalp of an older man, sent into us as just rule out malignancy. So shave biopsy, no additional information given. 
Uh, we did notice that there were these blood vessels here that seem to be increased in number. And over here, you can notice there's just a subtle suggestion that maybe they have this irregular jagged vascular appearance to it, maybe in this area as well. So this is what happens. You get a superficial shave biopsy of an angiosarcoma. They're lucky that they hit some of these areas. But again, this didn't come in as an angiosarcoma, it just came in as rule out malignancy. So uh, just for those of you that are uh, dermatopathologists, again, these don't always look like classic lesions clinically, and unfortunately, people aren't going to take good incisional deep biopsies for us uh, all the time. So again, just beware if you're a dermatologist, you're occasionally going to encounter one of these kind of lesions. Just statistically, you're going to have a case of, a, of an angiosarcoma, you're going to have a case of, of one of these, and if you don't take a deep enough biopsy, one that's representative, it can lead to medical legal liability for everyone. Um, this entity, epithelial sarcoma, uh, again, fairly uncommon, but it's, again, one of these very uh, wolf in sheep's clothing kind of things because they can sometimes present as a small ulcerative nodule like this. Um, how many of you would think this is a soft tissue sarcoma if this presented in your practice? Uh, small little red ulcerated papule. You'd probably take a biopsy of it, but you probably wouldn't even entertain the possible diagnosis of anything like this. These lesions, it's, it's been called uh, a, uh, a carcinoma of soft tissue way because they express both cytokeratin as well as vimentin and markers of soft tissue neoplasia. Again, you get uh, both spindle and epithelioid cells in this lesion. Here's an example of one of these. Histologically, they sometimes can look like a palisaded granulomatous dermatitis, uh, and the, uh, this, this often is a medical legal problem because nobody suspects it. They take a biopsy, get signed out as granulomanulare. It's seen in a relatively young individual. It's the most common soft tissue sarcoma of the extremities of young individuals, and then it gets misdiagnosed, and then bad things happen. But even though there's a suggestion that maybe this might be sort of uh, like a granulomatous process, you can see that these cells are somewhat atypical. They're epithelioid, based on the name, uh, and then some of them are somewhat spindle in morphology as well. So if you see something that looks like GA histologically, it's always not a bad idea to maybe take another second or two and just make sure there's no atypical cells, if there's anything unusual about it at all, so that you're not missing the diagnosis. These do express cytokeratin. You can see it's almost got this palisaded granuloma-like morphology the way that these cells are centered around that central zone of a pseudo, uh, it's basically palisaded granuloma. This is probably just tumor necrosis where the cells are like palisading around that. And it's also strongly positive for vimentin here. So again, just remember this entity. Um, there are several other forms. Uh, this was one uh, on the hand of an individual. Again, you can see he had a ray amputation at proximal metastases, another example. So again, notice these soft tissue tumors, when they appear in the skin, um, they don't look like anything. So just like Ted was saying yesterday, if you've got to think for 60 seconds more, think about infection. If you're looking at a possible tumor and you've got to think a little bit longer, this doesn't look like classic basal cell, it doesn't look like a squamous cell. Think about one of these weird things and take a good deep biopsy of it. Don't just take a superficial shave or you're likely to get back an erroneous diagnosis. This is another example of epithelioid sarcoma occurring on this young man's finger. This actually was a young basketball player uh, out of North Carolina a number of years ago. And here's an example of his lesion. Again, it looks almost kind of like a rheumatoid nodule initially, a deep lesion with central tumor necrosis kind of simulating palisaded granuloma. So for those of you that do dermatopathology, just always remember this tumor and uh, you don't want to miss this diagnosis. Now, what do we, we talk about epithelioid, there's actually sort of several others. We talk about epithelioid angiosarcoma, we have epithelioid sarcoma, you have epithelioid schwannomas, epithelioid melanomas, epithelioid lyomasarcomas. Just remember there's a family of these lesions that look like carcinomas, look less aggressive than they really are. So just remember those for the future and That'll keep you out of trouble. The last thing I'm going to talk about is this entity, and this is also super rare, but I had a friend of mine, a former resident I trained with, have one of these in her practice. It was a deep, soft tissue lesion. She thought it was a lipoma. It was a friend of hers. She said, well, we're just going to watch this. We're not going to do anything about it. Kept getting bigger. She sent it for liposuction. The guy liposuctioned everything out and uh, didn't put anything in the tissue bottle because he thought it was fat, and then it didn't really respond very well, and then they finally did a biopsy, and it was a mixoid uh, lipo 
lipo or fibrosarcoma. So just remember, and again, notice this thing, it, it doesn't look like a typical clinical uh, skin cancer. It looks weird. And uh, these things, when they present in the skin, they're not really skin tumors. They're occurring from, from deeper areas involving the skin secondarily. So something like this, don't take a shave biopsy. Just don't even think about it. And I'd recommend, if you, if you don't feel comfortable biopsying it in your practice, send it to a surgeon and let them take an incisional biopsy because these things you really need to get depth to see. And also, derms don't think about doing imaging studies before biopsies. Send it for an MRI or send it for an x-ray first or a CT scan and then see how deep this thing goes and then, then do the biopsy. So these can give you uh, these spindle cells uh, with a very mixoid stroma. Sometimes the stroma is so mixoid, again, notice this is a deep lesion. It's not really affecting the, the normal areas of the skin, the dermis, and, and the papillary dermis not really involved. Um, again, it looks a lot like a mixoma. Uh, these cells are, are a little bit pleomorphic, and they're, you may or may not see very many mitotic figures. But when you get these mixoid lesions, I have a lot of respect for these. Um, I, I get very concerned about the possibility of mixoid areas in, in uh, desoplastic melanoma. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Mixoid DFSP, these mixoid soft tissue tumors that affect the skin secondarily. So, so beware of these. Have a a lot of respect for them and uh, don't uh, don't just take a superficial biopsy so you want to be careful that uh, you don't miss these diagnoses no see so some of these can be kind of low grade they have a chromosomal abnormalities uh, but again they can metastasize uh, down the road so these are just some other mixoid lesions just to consider uh, and just remember uh, this whole family of these weird lesions that you may encounter in your practices so uh, I think with that, let's take a break. Uh, let's uh, come back in around 11.30ish or so, and then we'll have a next session, a good session on uh, radiation uh, oncology. Thank you for your attention.